Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hate Live Beta Podcast Episode 3, coming to you live from hot, disgusting, muggy Connecticut on June 27th, 2013. Without further ado, here is your host, DSP. Hello, Kermit the Frog here. Alright, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) I actually did a Kermit impression earlier in the week in my uh, SGC recap video. Uh, And people went nuts. They were like, I can't believe how good he is at the Kermit impression. He should do that more often. No, I'm not going to be doing the Kermit voice all the time. But that was I I do actually do a really good, uh, you know, Kermit intro. In fact, here you go. Watch this. Good evening, everyone. Kermit the Frog here, and welcome to the June 27th, 2013 episode of Hate Live Beta Podcast, Episode 3. And now here's your host, DSP. Yay! All right, there you go. I got it out of my system. (laughs) All right, so I am excited. First of all, you may be saying to yourself, why is Phil doing a podcast this particular day, usually the last Thursday of the month, he does Ask the King, which is the series where I answer fan mail and questions like that. Uh, that's been delayed a week, and the reason is because there's a lot to talk about this week. A lot of developments, uh, ideas that kind of popped into my head, especially after attending SGC this past weekend. We've got a huge announcement in this podcast regarding my content for the summer, and we're going to talk about that. I've already talked about it on streams earlier this week, but I never revealed what the, st- the announcement is and what the secret is. That's coming up right now in this podcast. So if you're interested, you definitely, if you're especially if you're going to, you know, interested in what's Phil doing all summer, what will I look forward to be watching? This is what you need to watch in this podcast, okay? Now, there are people watching on live stream right now on Twitch. If you are watching on live stream, you can submit your questions for the third segment of the podcast, which is open Q&A via the raffle. There's a raffle going on right now in the the stream chat. I'm pointing to my laptop, by the way. And you can actually submit your questions right now. We're going to do a random raffle at the end of the show, and I will be answering some questions. So definitely submit those if you want. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, on the King of Hate Vlogs, I have timestamps that I put in the description of the video. So if there's a particular segment of the show that you don't care for, like, oh, I don't hate it when he recaps what he did this week, he talks about what he's doing next week, I don't give a shit, you can skip to the segment that you want to watch. In addition, you can use that to skip the commercials. I do do commercial breaks between every segment. You can use those timestamps to skip them, okay? I'm not going to be editing out the commercial breaks. It takes way too much time. The show's almost two hours long. You know how long it would take to edit out three commercial breaks? It would be a major pain in the ass, okay? All right, so that being said, let's do a very quick recap of what we're going to be talking about in today's episode, a very special episode of Hate Live. First of all, we're going to be talking about gaming news first. We're actually going to get that out of the way up front. i got three major news stories I want to talk about that are really interesting to me that have happened just over the past few days. I want to recap what I did this past week. I want to preview what I'm doing next week, especially because I didn't have a chance to do a week in preview last week because I was at SGC, Screwtech Gaming Convention. Um... And then it's going to be the huge announcement <clears throat> regarding what I'm going to be doing this summer. And I think people are going to like, some people are going to be overwhelmed with joy, doing backflips off their sofas, their pants will fly off, they'll be doing meat spin on their couch, they'll be doing all kinds of crazy shit, alright? And then there's going to be some people, and there's always those people, who are like, well, hmm, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. So, no matter what, even if the announcement's good, if it's not what I want, it's bad. DSP sucks, and I'm going to unsubscribe from him. (laughs) I'm fully expecting people to have that kind of negative reaction, so I apologize if the announcement isn't what the one particular thing that you want is, but I think it's still going to be good overall for most people, okay? Okay. So, then we're going to take a break. Going to come back from the break, and we're going to have a new segment of Back in the Day with DSP. That's right. We're going to talk about my gaming, uh, you know, growing up with games. My gaming experiences growing up as a kid... Uh, in the era when video games were becoming mainstream culture. And today's episode is going to be the very first installment of what I'm going to call an ongoing series called Tales of Arcadia. And you might say, what the hell does that mean? It's all about video arcades. I have six specific little mini-stories that I want to tell everyone about 
my experiences growing up in video arcades, and it's actually going to span all the way from the beginning of when I started going to arcades all the way to the end, to near the end of my tournament run when I stopped playing Street Fighter competitively. So it's going to be a variety of stories. I think you're going to enjoy them. This is just a snippet, a little snippet of the amount of knowledge and stories that I have about the times when I was in arcades. So if you like this segment, don't worry. This is going to be coming back on Hate Live from time to time when I have a feeling that I, I want to talk about arcades again. Okay? Then after that segment, we're going to take another break. And then we're going to come back with the final segment of the show, which is going to be the open Q&A with the raffle. So everyone continue to please ask, ask, submit your questions, especially if a new question comes up during the course of the stream because of the stuff that we're talking about, especially the big announcement. Go ahead and submit those, and you have a chance of having your question answered at the end of the show. The only thing I do want to say, please... If you are using the raffle to submit your question, do not submit your question multiple times if it's the same one. Because I saw people doing that last time around, and that's not right. You're basically gaming the system to increase your chances of having your question answered, and that's not right. There are some pretty legitimate questions that people want to get answered, and if you're being a dick about it and cheating, that's uh, basically making, giving them less of a chance to have their question answered. So please do not do that, or else the mods will get very angry, and I just spilled water all over my crotch. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm soaked. I fucking spilled water all over my crotch. So I'm glad that I have some napkins right here. Holy shit. Some napkins. Oh, man. Oh, I'm soaked. All right, good start to the show. <laughs> all right, gaming news as I dry my balls off. Gaming news this week. All right, the first story I want to talk about uh, is if, you, if you're not in the know or if you didn't see my previous vlog about it, Several weeks to a month ago, Capcom and that, Capcom, blah, blah, blah. the waters on my balls apparently affects my brain. Uh, Nintendo, it was announced by, actually it wasn't Nintendo that announced this, it was actually Zack Scott Games, which is a very well-known YouTube channel known for doing Nintendo playthroughs and Let's Plays. And Zack Scott basically said that he got a copyright infringement strike from Nintendo and that he was disputing it, but what the hell was up? Why was Nintendo doing this? And so the mainstream press contacted Nintendo, and a Nintendo rep officially came out and publicly said, as of January of this year, we submitted claims uh, for all of our intellectual property to YouTube, and we will be enforcing it, and anyone who does Let's Plays, don't worry, we're not a bad company, we're not going to give you a copyright strike, but what we're going to do is we're going to claim the rights to all of your videos that have Nintendo content in them, we're going to put our ads on them, and we're going to make money off of your hard work because you're using our intellectual property in your video, so we're just going to steal all of your work and make money on it. To which everyone in the gaming community was like, talk about an anti-gamer practice. People who are doing Let's Plays of Nintendo games are basically giving free advertising for Nintendo. Nintendo now says we want to make money off of that. Um, and it's just the most anti-gamer practice, and a lot of people, including myself, were up in the air about possibly continuing doing any kind of gameplay of, of a, a first-party Nintendo title because we were afraid Nintendo might try to fucking claim the rights on it. And especially for someone like me, and there's lots of other people, they make money off of their videos, you're just going to steal the money. And I was, had, was up in arms about this, and the point that I made in my... I had made a big rant video about it, was that, sure, yes, it is Nintendo's intellectual property, but a Let's Play is not a carbon copy reproduction of a video game. If I copied the disc of, say, Zelda Wind Waker, and then I brought, gave that code to someone else, or if I copied the disc and just handed it to someone else, that's copyright infringement. But if I'm playing the game and adding my own commentary, my own gameplay as an input, my skill, that is something that I created, not Nintendo. Sure, Nintendo created the framework, but I'm the one moving the parts. So that's absolutely absurd saying that that's not part of, at least partially, my property. And I really feel that the copyright laws are draconian in this regard, that they don't really apply to video game playthroughs whatsoever or video games whatsoever. Because video games are a unique interactive medium. Nothing else is like a video game. And therefore, really, we need better laws to redefine how copyright works with video games. And so for Nintendo to just put their foot down and say to YouTube, we just want to claim everything that's Nintendo, and for YouTube to basically bend over and say, yes, sir, we'll do whatever you say because we don't want to deal with a lawsuit, sir, because we're a fucking inept business owned by Google, and they don't put any fucking effort into us. We do, you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. So I did a big rant video about it. Well, the news this week is that supposedly 
Nintendo, and it's a rumor, it hasn't been confirmed, Nintendo may be backpedaling a little bit. So in two weeks, what a bunch of backpedaling. First, Microsoft backpedals with the Xbox One and all of its negative shit that n nobody wanted. Now we've got Nintendo possibly backpedaling, saying that we may not be doing that, okay? And it was actually confirmed by Zach Scott Games, the guy who blew this whole story open to begin with. He says he's begun putting up more Nintendo vids, and nothing's going on. Like, Nintendo isn't putting copyright claims or claims on his ads or anything against them. The, the, the problem here is that no one is outright saying anything. Nintendo isn't saying yes or no, and YouTube isn't saying yes or no. So really, we can't feel safe posting Nintendo content. However, at least this is a step in the right direction. If no one's really been getting crazy, uh, you know, copyright strikes or even have their ads be claimed by Nintendo and Nintendo making money, maybe it's not going to happen. I personally was affected on one video. It was part one of Zelda Wind... Uh, I'm sorry, Zelda Skyward Sword. I actually put a copyright dispute on that video, and actually, when I was at SGC, I would have been the time when I could see whether or not it got cleared up. I haven't checked yet. I actually think it probably did, but I'm going to double-check that, but... I wasn't affected, and you know, I've done a lot of Nintendo games. I've done Super Mario, uh, a few different Super Marios. I've done, uh, you know, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. I've done Zeldas. I've done these games, and so it's a concern to me that all of a sudden Nintendo might start claiming my content, too. I have only seen it on one video. Zach Scott says he's not seeing it on any videos, so maybe it was just some, some bullshit. Maybe it was literally just a mistake or a copyright match that was automated, and, you know reaching out, I think it was Kotaku that reached out to Nintendo, they just reached the wrong idiotic PR rep, because it seems to me there are a lot of idiotic PR reps for these major game developers, and the guy didn't know what the fuck he was talking about, and he talked out of his ass, I don't know, there's no real confirmation on this story, but the bottom line is right now, it's looking like possibly you could still do Let's Plays with Nintendo games, and they're not going to try to claim your content, so that's a good thing, we'll have more on that, obviously, as the year progresses, and we see what happens with new games from Nintendo. The next story that I'd like to talk about is Atlas, and this one just came out today, so it's pretty fresh and hot off the presses. Today it was made public that the company that's the, not Atlas themselves, the game developer, but the parent company, the company that owns Atlas, is going to be applying for like civil financial protections, which in Japan what it basically means is they're about to declare bankruptcy, which means they have no money. They're, they basically are really in dire straits. And so it may look like someone might be stepping up and maybe someone's going to try take a try trying to buy out Atlas. Now, a lot of people are saying, how could this happen? Atlas seems to be a game, a game company that makes a lot of good games. They made Catherine, uh, a lot of JRPGs and that style of stuff. Uh, just recently they had the Persona fighting game. And of course, I would like to say, well, maybe Atlas, I would give a shit about you if maybe you didn't give me copyright strikes on my DSP Street Fighter channel last year for posting up the fucking tutorial of Persona, alright, which is absolutely ridiculous, the tutorial of your fighting game, you give me a legit copyright strike for, you can go fuck yourself in that regard, but I do realize that there's more than one person that works for Atlas, and it's probably just some overzealous asshole who did that and flagged my video. So the question is, who's going to snag them up? And I think there's a lot of concern. People are worried that if one of these bigger companies like Nintendo or EA or one of these other developers pick them up, that they're going to try to change them and make them conform to their ways. And Atlas has always been a, a company that does the quirky style anime game. Let's take a look at Catherine. Do you really think that any other company could have pulled off a game like Catherine the way that they did and have it be such a success? So I think a lot of people are really worried. So you might be saying, well, how did this happen? How could the parent company be in trouble? The bottom line is this, a lot of these companies are owned by big corporations that are diversified. So even though Atlas is owned by this company, they may own interests in other things. Maybe they have interests in electronics. Maybe they have interests in software coding. Maybe they have interests in, who knows, it could be anything. And maybe their other interests aren't doing so well. And because of that, it's now negatively affecting the parent company, which is going to lead to them not being able to support Atlas. Um, it's, it's very uncertain right now. It's the very first stages. It was the first announcement today that this is the, the, the case. And so a lot of people are just hearing about it for the first time. I just heard about it actually during my earlier stream today when I was doing God of War gameplay. But it's, it's worrying. But at the same time, Atlas is a company that I think if they do get bought out by someone else, because the content that they make is so unique, they may be able to stay away from the, oh, let's change them all kind of attitude. They may end up being uh, one of those studios that gets picked up and kind of left alone. Okay, just keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a good job. So we'll have to see what happens with that, but that is a developing story. All right. The last story that we have for today is 
the I don't know how to pronounce this. The Ouya, the the I think it's Ouya, or the Wea. I don't know how to say it because it's O U Y A. This console was released this week. Okay, and first of all, a lot of people didn't even know this console was coming out this week, and when it came out, they were like, "What? Really? It's out?" So you may not know what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm talking about is this. That's right. I finally got mine in the mail today. I ordered it the other day when I got back from SGC. The Ouya is an independent gaming console. It's not made by one of these huge corporations. The reason that it exists is because of, I think it was either Kickstarter or one of those similar websites put up this project and said, donate money, We're gonna, we want to make an independent Android-based gaming console. And the whole premise of Ouya is that you get to play games on it without buying them and to try them out. And if you like the game, then you'll buy the full version. So basically what it is, it's a portable Android device where you can download these, these previously mobile-only games to your console, test them out, and if you like it, you can purchase the full game and play it on your TV. It's an interesting premise, and people are wondering if it's going to succeed. The cool thing about it, it's only $100. Name me another console that's only $100, and it comes with the, you know, the actual console and a controller. However, it only runs Android games. Like, Just take a look at the back of the box, the games that they're showing on there. Final Fantasy III, the mobile version... Uh, I don't even know what the fuck that game is right there. So it's basically mobile games, to which a lot of people say, I already have a smartphone. Why do I need to spend another $100 on my Ouya when I can play the games on my smartphone? Okay? And that's a valid point. These aren't full, you know, full-length console games for the most part. There are going to be exceptions. Like I said, Final Fantasy III is coming. There are going to be mobile versions of full games that are coming out. But the bottom line is, will this succeed? Do people really want to spend $100 on a console that only plays mobile games? So I'm actually going to be covering this tomorrow. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment because we're going to run through my schedule for the week. But tomorrow, I'll be covering the Ouya on my gaming channel, DSP Gaming, and also here on Twitch. I'm going to be streaming it. We're going to be live streaming it and checking out the interface and checking out what games are available. And we're going to be testing it all out live together. So that's going to be really exciting. And we're going to see for ourselves whether or not this is worth 100 bucks or not. Okay. It's funny because there was so much hype when this thing was first announced. People were like, oh, the Ouya. Oh, I'm so excited about the Ouya. I can't wait. Independent console. We don't have to worry about Sony or Microsoft bullshit. And then when it was finally announced, well, it's only going to run Android games, people were like, dope. Like the whole idea kind of like exploded. And now it's funny because even right now I can see people in the chat here are like, yeah, the whole idea died. We don't care about it anymore. We're not going to spend 100 bucks to play mobile games. So, huh. Okay, here we go. So, that's it for gaming news. That's all that's really to talk about this week. Next time when we do a, a, a Hate Live in two weeks, hopefully there'll be more to talk about, okay? Now what we're going to do, I'd like to recap this past week, what I've been doing, and also what's coming up in the week, because like I said, I didn't do a week in preview. A lot of people are probably wondering what the hell's going on, okay? So first of all, this past weekend was Screwtack Gaming Convention. I'm not going to go into full detail about what that is, because I've talked about it a thousand times, and I even did a full series of videos of vlogs from the event, and I also did a recap video after the event showing my acquisitions and all that. So that's all that stuff is live over on the King of Hate Vlogs on YouTube. So if you haven't seen it yet, definitely check it out. It's pretty entertaining stuff. I even made the top eight of the Iron Man of Gaming competition and was able to participate live on stream, which I absolutely love. And I do want to say once again, thank you so much to Stuttering Craig and to everyone at Screw Attack for having us out. It was an amazing event. I still need to type Craig up. I'm going to type him a nice formal thank you email. But we had such a good time. We, we hope that they have us back next year because it was such a great time and we definitely want to go back. Dallas was an awesome city. Great food, great venue, great everything. We had a lot of fun. Thank you to all the fans who came out to meet us. The panel was successful. had about 40 people. Uh, we met all kinds of cool people from the forums and different areas who we never met before because we've never been to Texas before. So thank you to everyone who came out. Special shout-outs to a few people. Master of Awesomeness, um, the Gamer J. Lee, Sturmgeist. These guys kind of hung out with us and also helped us with certain things like our panel. So thanks a lot to those three. But thanks to everyone who came out and met us. We had a grand fun time, and we look forward to it again next year, hopefully. Um, so... After SGC, uh, the new game this week was Deadpool. And the rumor was, oh, looks like mainstream media is panning this game in their reviews. They're saying it's way too short and it's not good and it's repetitive. The bottom line is, I beat it yesterday. I love the game, okay? 
if you're a fan of Deadpool and if you're a fan of Marvel Comics or if you're just a fan of quirky, fun games, this is the game for you. The game is made to have some kind of variety in gameplay during the combat, but also to incorporate some of the most off-the-wall zany moments that I've seen in games recently. And that's the spirit of the game. And if you understand the character Deadpool and that's what he is, and you play the game, you're going to love the game. If you go into the game thinking, oh, this is going to be a 20-hour fucking masterpiece of innovation where, you know, it's all about amazing, groundbreaking gameplay, and you go into it with a preconceived notion, you will not like the game, and I think that's what a lot of these stupid-ass mainstream reviewers did, once again. With their thumb firmly up their fucking ass, they play a game that's different and attempting to be quirky and funny as its primary focus, and instead all they do is bash the game for having repetitive gameplay, which is to be expected in this style of game of what it is, and... They misreview the game. And I'm going to say that, yes, it's called a misreview. When you don't weigh facts versus actual, you know, your subjectivity and your opinion. It has to have a balance, and I get the feeling these idiots didn't do that yet again. But I guarantee you these same fucking mainstream sites will be saying, Oh, Call of Duty, Battlefield 4, these are 10s out of 10. It's a perfect game, absolutely. It's the same fucking game as last year. 10 out of 10, it's so good. But then they take a game that's original and quirky like Deadpool, 5, 5 out of 10. Because the gameplay wasn't groundbreaking. You're like, fuck you, fuck you. And I want to say this. I have to say this. If you're still going to IGN, the website, their videos, whatever. If you're still watching their content or going to them for gaming news and gaming reviews, you are just out of your mind. After the fiasco of what happened at E3 with Mitch Dyer misreporting about Killer Instinct, okay, and completely having false facts making the game look like shit, and causing a media frenzy about the game, panning the game, saying the game is bad because it's a free-to-play game that you have to buy each character individually, which was 100% incorrect. The fact that, number one, Mitch Dyer is not fired. He still works. He, he's not fired from IGN, even though he blatantly misrepresented facts in his report and made a, basically lied about a game. Not only does he still work for IGN, they never retracted the story nor corrected it. So that information is out there, and they're like, oh, well, fuck it. We don't care. So basically, IGN is not serious about journalism. They're not serious journalists. What they are now, they're becoming sensationalist whores who are just trying to get more people to go to their site because they need to get hits. That's it. Because they realize that no one cares about IGN anymore, and so they have to sensationalize shit to try to get people to even watch their content. So do not watch the mainstream media bullshit, especially IGN. They're not even professional. They, they literally... We know that what they said is factually wrong. They never apologized. They never retracted the story. And they didn't fire the guy that made the, the false information to begin with. They suck. Fuck that company. Okay? All right. So now let's get back on track. Um, so then, after I played Deadpool, I today started playing God of War HD, which was the game that actually won the poll for next downtime game. And I know that not a lot of people are probably going to be so crazy about it. The game got about 3,000 volts total in the poll that I held for the next downtime game. I'm hoping that over the course of the playthrough, at least 3,000 people check out every video. I don't even know if it's going to do that well, because I do know it's an old game, and uh, it's a game that maybe not a lot of people are going to be taking their time out to watch. I understand that. But it won the poll, and I know some people are upset. Oh, why didn't he play Devil May Cry 3? Well, Devil May Cry 3 was in the poll. It didn't even make top three. It actually came in fourth place. So for all the people who are stomping their feet and saying, why didn't he play Devil May Cry 3? You're the vocal minority. Seriously, you're the people who you want to see it, but would anyone watch it if I played the game? Because you didn't even get top three in the poll, okay? I have to go with whatever game wins the poll. So hopefully people watch the playthrough of God of War HD. I don't know if they're going to. Um, but we'll have to see what happens with that. So I, I did a stream of that today. That footage will actually be going up live tomorrow on DSP Gaming, just so everyone who's interested knows. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to, for the, my first stream, doing the Ouya walkthrough. So what I'm going to do, since I don't live stream unboxings, I'm going to film an unboxing of the console, and that's going to go up on the King of Hate Vlogs as a separate video. But then I'm also going to be... Actually, you know what? I'll probably upload that to DSP Gaming as a separate video, because I'm going to have a playlist all about the Ouya, Okay. Then I'm going to hook this sucker up, we're going to live stream me booting it, we'll get all the menus, going through it all, um, you know, I'm going to be basically doing a full walkthrough of the console, 
do first impressions. We'll download a few demos of games, try out the games. I'll let you know what I think about the controller. So it's going to be interesting. Launch week coverage of the Ouya tomorrow at uh, on my first stream, okay? Then my second stream tomorrow is going to be Demon Souls. The first time I'm playing the game in two weeks. Really excited to get back to it, okay? I'm really, really excited to get back to it. Um, because I've leveled myself to the point where I can easily beat most enemies. At the same time, I now know how to beat the trolls. I completely dominated 4chan and butt-fucked 4chan the last time that I played Demon Souls. It was absolutely fucking hilarious. I can't wait for them to try again and fail miserably yet again tomorrow night. Demon Souls continues live on stream, and then of course will be uploaded overnight to YouTube. Definitely be here for that. It's going to be a lot of fun, okay? Alright, uh, then Saturday, John Rambo will be here to film the 100th episode of Smart Guys. That's right, it's the 100th episode anniversary of Smart Guys, our ongoing pro wrestling commentary show. And I'm amazed that we got that far. I mean, we've been doing it since 2010. So you figure that's roughly, what, 30 episodes a, a year, skipping, you know, a few weeks here and there for when we're busy. In fact, we haven't done one in two weeks. It's going to be great. It's going to be a combination of talking about what's going on right now in pro wrestling, but also combining that with a celebration of all the stuff that's happened over the 100 episodes, the things that have changed in pro wrestling. Uh, we're going to actually reminisce a little bit about the plot lines and stuff from older shows. It's going to be a great show. Definitely check it out on the live stream and also when it gets uploaded to the King of Hate vlogs if you can't watch it live this Saturday. But... The other big thing is that on Saturday we are going to attempt, and I say attempt because it's not guaranteed it's going to come together, we're going to attempt to do a four-player cooperative playthrough. The reason this is a special one is because it is the return of my friend Nestor and the possible, yes that's right, possible return to my videos of Howard. And you might be saying, holy shit, we haven't seen Howard in a video on DSP Gaming in so long that I know we haven't found anything to play. This is the opportunity where Howard may actually be able to play with us. We're trying to get that logistically put together right now, okay? What game are we going to be playing? It's going to be Dungeons & Dragons Shadows of Mistara HD Collection. This was a game that came out last week as an Xbox Live and PlayStation Network downloadable game. It is an HD remake of the classic side-scrolling beat-em-ups from the 1990s that Capcom put out in arcades. The difference here is that there's online co-op. And, supposedly, they've added four-player co-op. I never had that in arcades. It was two- or three-player only. So they actually added four-player capability. It's going to be absolutely awesome if we can make this come together. I really hope that we can do it on Saturday, and I really hope that Howard can make it. So that's going to be Saturday. It's going to be nuts. It's going to be a fun day, okay? Okay. Sunday, Monday, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing. There may be, I might actually go to Fallout 3. I may actually be checking out the Ouya some more if I like it, or I like some games that I started with it. I may be playing some more of that. I may do more God of War HD, or depending on if some stuff shows up tomorrow, really hoping that shipping comes through on this, but I may be starting my idea for the summer downtime. So now that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Tell everyone if they've been ignoring the stream or ignoring the show up to now. I'm going to timestamp it right now. I'm about to make my big announcement regarding my content for the summer and what you can expect for these summer months uh, that are coming up. Okay, here we go. So, here's the thing about the summer. The summer is traditionally the slowest time of the year for video game releases. I don't know why. It's really weird because, think about it, most kids are out of school for the summer. They're at home to play video games. A lot of people are on extended vacations during the summer or shut down. Teachers are off of work during the summer. There's a lot of occupations that just don't work during the summer. And you would think, okay, this would be a great time to release video games because everyone's at home doing nothing. No, this is like the worst time of the year. Almost no new games come out during the summer. And in fact, case in point, I actually have filmed a new update video for my gaming schedule. That video I will be actually uploading tomorrow to the King of Hate vlogs for those of you who are interested. And... Uh, I looked it up, and during this summer, there's very little going on. Next week, you've got the, the a Call of Duty Zombies map pack, which I'm going to be doing. And you also got Zod for Injustice. That's another DLC. After that, you literally have nothing coming out until Dynasty Warriors 8, which is the middle of July. Then you literally have nothing coming out until the last week of July, which is just some downloadable game called Deadfall. The, the month is pretty much empty, 
okay? Even August, there's a couple weeks, yes, there's a week or two where there's a game or two, like Pikmin 3 or Tales of Zillia, but outside of those, there's almost nothing going on until the very end of August when all of a sudden a whole bunch of games come out at once. So we've got a pretty dead summer ahead of us. And I was thinking about, what am I going to do during the summer to keep you occupied? Because I realize a lot of my fan base are people who are in school, uh, whether it's, you know, high school, college, and you guys are out for the summer, and traditionally I do get actually a view boost in the summer because people are out, and they want they have free time, they want to watch my content. So I was like, i got to put out something entertaining for you guys. Now, in previous uh, years, I basically did marathons. I did, like, uh, one year I did a Spider-Man marathon and a Batman marathon because the Spider-Man and Batman movies came out that year. I did a Grand Theft Auto marathon. I did Mega Man marathons. So it's always been about the marathons. And I said, what would be a cool thing that I could do to keep everyone entertained this summer, but something that I really want to do, and something different, too. Not just, oh, another game. Like I said, God of War HD, it's fun, but at the same time, I think a lot of, oh, it's just War of the Same. It's a modern game that Phil Skiff, he's already played the other God of Wars. This isn't very interesting. I think a lot of people have that mentality. So I want to do something that I've pretty much almost never done before, and I want to do it this summer, and it's going to be a huge thing. I hope it's going to attract new people to my content for the very first time because it's something that I don't do very often. So let's talk. All right. The huge announcement for the summer of my content is officially being called the Summer of Retro. If you don't know what that means, a while back I remember, I think it was like a year or two ago, on Ask the King, someone asked me, they said, Phil, if you had a gaming bucket list, a list of games that you wanted to play before you quit doing videos whatsoever for the internet, what would they be? And I really sat back and I said, let me think about it. I said, you know what, really the, the golden era of when I grew up playing games was the SNES era. That was really the era that I feel that the console was the best. It was better than the Genesis. It had amazing graphics, had the ability to have really long games compared to the other consoles. And that was the era I grew up in of the SNES. I said, you know, I would really like to re-experience the games from my childhood that I rank as some of the best games ever made, but I'd like to do it in an environment where I do it for YouTube so that people can actually see these games and see the playthroughs and, and experience these games firsthand for themselves. Okay. Now, see, he's already people going nuts. People are going absolutely nuts right now in the chat, which is hilarious. I knew this was going to happen. Um, and, of course, some people are pissed off. Oh, no, it's not the games that I want. All right, calm down. We're going to talk about it. Let's talk it out. Everyone, take a deep breath. Let's talk it out, all right? And so, at the time, I thought, really, in my head, what are the games that I would absolutely love to play from my childhood on YouTube? And I was thinking about it, and I did, I made a list. I'm, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but I don't want to get to that yet because I want to get to my point. And I said, okay, eventually I definitely want to do these. And then last year during the summer, one of the games that I actually did a playthrough of was Final Fantasy VI. And I was struggling, how am I going to play this game? I don't know how I would do it uh, you know, with my SNES because I don't have it for SNES. The game's really expensive for SNES. Uh, back then I was still recording with the camera, so I said, oh, I'll do the virtual console, and I was going to do it on PlayStation. And people told me, no, don't do it on PlayStation, the loading's insanely long. So I actually played the emulated version on the Nintendo Wii. But at that point, I was just still using my camera, and uh, I'm going to be honest with everyone. The playthrough, I really, I feel, was amazing, like for me, because I, it was basically a walkthrough. This was a game that I played multiple times as a, as a child. I absolutely loved the story. I was able to sing the fucking opera song which is something I used to do myself as a kid, and then I sang it on video. I really feel that my Final Fantasy VI playthrough is one of the best things I've ever put out ever for the Internet. Not a lot of people agree, because a lot of people are, oh, it's a retro game, and it's old, and oh, I'm not going to watch, that's too long, it's a JRPG, I don't like it. People are just this new generation of gamers don't respect the classics, okay? Okay? That's the truth. But there were lots of people who did watch it and absolutely loved it. And those are the people who I'm so happy that I did it because I basically introduced you to a game that maybe you never would have heard of or played, and it's a masterpiece, okay? So that being said, I was a little disappointed with the quality of the playthrough visually. The reason I was disappointed was because it didn't look great. It looked okay, but, you know, I was using my camera, so instead of it looking like a perfect square like it should, it was, like, bended, and the lighting was off in a lot of parts, and I was like, fuck, you know, this game is good, but I couldn't capture 
the essence of the game with the camera. Unlike newer games, which are widescreen, it's easier to record with a camera. So now, here we are a year later, fast forward. And I said, it's going to be a boring summer. There's no releases coming out. What am I going to do? And I do want to give special thanks to someone at SGC, in particular at the panel, who inspired me. And they said, listen, during the panel, during the opening Q&A, they said, Phil, when are you going to play Earthbound? Because you mentioned it, you want to play it, and when are you going to play it? And I said, you know, that's a great question, because at this point, what's really holding me back? I could play it whenever I want, because I do direct feed now. I could get the emulator, get the ROM, and just play it right now. And I was like, you know, this may be the time. This is a cool time where now I've changed my technology. It's a lot easier for me to do this stuff. The visual quality, the audio quality is going to be a lot better than it was with the camera. And the accessibility to get the games is easy. So now is the time. I know right off the bat some people want to say, oh my god, Phil's going to use ROMs. Well, the bottom line is this. I actually did try to buy the games and hook it up to a capture device. And I found out that the audio doesn't work properly with XSplit. That's right. For whatever reason, XSplit doesn't jive with Dazzle, which is like the, the, the uh, capture device that you would use for an old console, and the audio doesn't work. So it's either use emulators to play the games and get full quality visuals and audio, or try to jerry-rig some bullshit setup where I have to have the mic record my voice and the audio from the game. Probably wouldn't sound too good. So this is the case where I've owned these games when I was younger, I feel confident that if I play the ROMs, that people aren't going to say, go up and, oh, Phil stole the ROM. No, I owned the game when I was a kid. If I had a way to actually play the game with my capture device off the real SNES, I would. Unfortunately, I don't have the means to do that. I can't find a workaround to get it to work. So that's how I'm going to be doing it. So you might be saying, all right, Phil's talking so much. Is he going to tell me what he's going to be playing? All right. It's quite simple, actually. Um, I'm going to be playing a lot of the games that I put on my gaming bucket list that I really feel are the best games ever made, okay? In no particular order, and keep in mind this is not a closed list, meaning I may add or subtract things from this list as we move along. Earthbound, yes. I'm going to be playing Earthbound this summer. A Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. This one is very timely because they're making a sequel for it that's going to be released for the Nintendo 3DS later this year, it makes sense to play the first game now. This is like the right time to play that game. So I've decided I will be playing A Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. And I know a lot of people are going to find already, hooray, yes, people are going nuts. Yes, yes, I'm so happy. And I knew that some people were going to be saying that. That's one of my favorite games of all time. That's a game that without cheating, without looking shit up, I went back and found out almost all the secrets of that game on my own. I never had a strategy guide or anything for it. And that is a game that I could probably do a semi-completionist run, but there, I still think there's stuff I don't know about the game because I never, again, I never cheated. Um, the next one, this is going to be huge, ladies and gentlemen. Chrono Trigger, and I'm going to do every ending. That's right, I'm going to play Chrono Trigger, and I'm going to obtain every ending of the game. So you're going to get to see all alternate, I think there's like eight of them, alternate endings. I'm doing it this summer. That I've set myself to it, I'm doing it. Fuck it, I want to play the game so badly. I absolutely love Chrono Trigger. It's going to be so much fun to play it on stream and for direct capture. I'm loving it, okay? This is the, there's two more, two more big ones, and then there's other possibilities that I want to throw out to everyone. The next big one. Final Fantasy IV, okay? I've already done a playthrough of Final Fantasy IV The After Years, which was the way, way, way later they made a sequel to it for the Wii as a downloadable game, but I want to play the original. Final Fantasy IV was the, in my opinion, the quintessential JRPG. I grew up with it on the SNES as Final Fantasy II. That's actually what they called it in the United States. And that is the game that made me fall in love with role-playing games. And since then, I've been, you know, I love them. But that was the game that really, I got hooked on it, and I just wanted to play more role-playing games, okay? I'm going to be playing, oh, my nose is itching like crazy all of a sudden. I'm going to be playing Final Fantasy IV this summer. And that is another game I can do a completionist run for, because I know everything about the game. I know secrets about the game. I'm going to kick the game's ass. It's going to be so much fun, okay? Some people are going nuts right now. This is hilarious. In the, in the stream chat, people are like ripping their like, yes, shh, ripping their shirts off. Yes, he's playing. He's playing retro games. I love it. <laughs> people are going nuts. Um, I'm not done. I'm also going to do Super Mario World. Okay, 
Super Mario World, and my goal is I'm going to try to do a cooperative playthrough of it with John Rambo. That's going to be a game that I think we're going to be, we'll blow it out of the box, because it's such a good game. For me, that's the best platformer ever made. Super Mario World, it took the amazing formula from Super Mario Brothers 3, a game that we played earlier this year, and it kicked it up such a big notch for the 16-bit era that I really think it's one of the best games ever made. I don't know if there'll ever be a platformer that I think I'll say is better than it. And uh, I can't wait to play it, and I'm going to be playing it with John Rambo. Okay? This guy says, I just ripped my shirt and pants off. <laughs> Excellent. Now, okay. Now, those are the definites. Those are the games I definitely want to play this summer. So I, I'm hoping that between the new releases, between the fact that I got this downtime game, God of War, that, I'm gonna, that I've am gonna just started, and keep in mind I'm going to continue on with the Demon Souls, with Fallout 3, all that stuff's going to continue, okay? None of that stuff's going to end. But my goal is to play at least those minimum five games this summer, okay? Now, there are other possibilities of games that I want to play still. So another possibility of a game that I want to play is The Secret of Mana. I, this is a game I actually never owned the game as a child. I rented it probably like 20 times, got pretty far into it, but I never beat the game. And I'm actually disappointed with myself that I never actually beat the game. So I'm going to actually be possibly be playing Secret of Mana this summer, okay? Also, Final Fantasy V. Final Fantasy V was never released in the United States for the Super NES. However, it was later released in different collections and such. I've played Final Fantasy V. I love the game. I actually think it's a really good game. It was one of those games, though, where the story wasn't as good as the other Final Fantasies, but the gameplay was good. The gameplay actually had a job system where you could customize your characters completely. I'm thinking of doing it, but I'm thinking it may be too much overload if I do it this summer, but that's another possibility. Now, the other one is Super Mario RPG. This is a game that was a hybrid between Super Mario Brothers and Square Enix role-playing games during that era of the SNES. And I'm interested in playing it, but again, since I definitely want to play Chrono Trigger, Earthbound, and Final Fantasy IV, I'm worried it's going to be RPG Overload, okay? And so that's why I'm a little bit reserved to saying that I won't, I'm definitely playing that this year. But these are all possibilities for the summer, okay? The last one, which is last but not least, actually... People are saying less RPGs. Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. The one that I was saying uh, that's a possibility that I'm more than likely I am going to be playing this summer is, get ready, internets, get ready, because people are about to get angry, people are about to get excited, Metal Gear Solid 1, Metal Gear Solid 1, and the reason I want to play it is because in two weeks, actually it's less than two weeks now, the Metal Gear Solid collection is being released, and the game is in there, just not redone, it's the original, I'm going to probably play the original game, okay? So right now people are going nuts because they're like, oh my god, uh, Evil a AJ is at it and people are going to say, oh no, he's playing Metal Gear again. It's going to be insane. People are going to make fun of him. The internet's going to go crazy. I never even, I, I had Metal Gear Solid 1. I remember getting it for Christmas one year for the PlayStation 1. And I played it for several hours and I got bored because at that point in my life I didn't like the sneaking style of gameplay. Now, obviously, I've played a lot of that style of game. Even though I'm not very good at it, I may be able to actually play the whole game, Okay. Um, all right, so, you know, people are just saying, oh, new, new fail montage coming. There very well, well might be. The thing is, I'm not changing my mindset or my mentality. I know I'm not good at Metal Gear. I say it up front. And if people don't like that and they take offense to the fact that I make gameplay videos of games that I'm not very good at, fuck them. I don't care. You know what I mean? Fuck those people. If really all they have to focus on is me and the fact that I'm not good at games... Fuck them. They can do what they want. I'm going to play Metal Gear Solid 1, okay? So, it's the summer of retro. It's basically me going back and playing these games from my past that either I really love or a game like Metal Gear Solid 1, which I never completed. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think people are going to love it. I actually have ordered several USB SNES game pads to do this. There's three of them coming tomorrow because I have no idea which one's good. And if I do play Super Mario World with John Rambo, we each need to have a good one. So I ordered a bunch of them and we're going to be testing them out and trying to figure out which is the best one for PC. And this, this is going to be a very fun summer, to say the least. 
So I know a lot of people are probably disappointed. Oh, I can't believe it. He's going to play old game. Oh, well. The bottom line is there's not a lot coming out this summer. This is my way of providing entertaining content and to live stream. Uh, live streaming classic games. I'm going to get to see people's reactions to the stuff from the games of my childhood live on stream. How fucking awesome is that going to be? I am so excited. Like, like insanely legitimately excited to play these games with you guys and so i hope that you guys will definitely be there and join me either on the live streams or on youtube for the playthroughs and uh, i think this summer is going to be a blast this is a way to turn around a bad situation where there's nothing coming out and it's boring and turn it into a really awesome positive situation so thank you everyone i'm going to try to do all this this for you this summer it's going to be a lot of fun Look, people are going nuts in the chat still. They're like, oh, we're, we're loving this. It's going to be so good. Um, so that's the announcement. The Summer of Retro. And by any means, if people would like to start making, you know, the title, the title screen things for when I go on breaks during these playthroughs, if people would like to make the Summer of Retro logo that I could put on stuff, by all means, graphic designers, get to work. I will use that stuff. It's gold, and I, I definitely appreciate all the work that people have done for me already. And I know it's just going to be coming together to be an awesome summer all overall, okay? All right, so that's it. That's the huge announcement that I wanted to make. Um, the definite games I'm playing, again, to recap, Earthbound, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy IV, and Super Mario World, with the possibility of other games like Metal Gear Solid 1, uh, Final Fantasy V, Secret of Mana, Super Mario RPG, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Gonna be a fun summer, everybody. Definitely gonna be a fun summer. Alright. So this ends segment one of the podcast. I'm now going to take a short commercial break. I'm gonna come back in a few minutes, and we are going to do Back in the Day. And again, this is the beginning of the Tales of Arcadia, stories from the past of my experiences in video arcades. It's gonna be really good, so definitely stick around. If you're on the stream, stick around. I'll be right back. If you're on YouTube, you can go ahead and look right down here at the timestamp. Give it a click to skip the commercial break, and we'll come right back with Tales of Arcadia. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll be back in a minute.
Okay, everybody, welcome back to Hate Live. Uh, this is segment two, where what we're going to be doing is my back in the day stories, where I talk about my experiences growing up as a gamer, uh, my unique kind of take on the whole time frame when video games were becoming more mainstream in culture. And this is actually going to be my very first segment where I'm going to call it Tales of Arcadia, because I really feel that the whole arcade generation, the fact that I was able to grow up uh, in a time when games were being played in this building called a video arcade, a lot of people don't even know what that is anymore, because now everything's at home on console. Consoles are actually better than what you could play in a video arcade. But I grew up in this very unique time frame when I was playing Street Fighter at a competitive level, and I had all these experiences in video arcades that I really want to relay to you, and I think you're really going to like it. Uh, what I have for you today is actually a story of six different kind of mini-stories, uh, talking about different personalities that I met over the years in video arcades, but also talking about uh, just kind of funny experiences and things that happen. And this is going to be spanning from the very beginning of times when I first started in video arcades all the way up to when I pretty much retired from arcade gameplay and uh, retired from the tournament scene, okay? So... <clears throat> When video arcades first started out, it was funny because every local arcade kind of had their own personalities. Yeah, the, the kind of people, oh, I know that guy, he's that funny guy with this personal trait or whatever. And uh, there are a couple characters that I actually want to talk about from my local arcade, which was actually called Crazy 8 Arcade. Uh, and then later on, uh, changed its name several times. But uh, there was this one guy, his name was Joe. Now this was around the era when Street Fighter 2 was new, okay? So we're talking the original Street Fighter 2. And so people kind of like, a lot of the times, like to pick characters who either were like kind of to their liking or maybe even looked like them. Joe was a big fucking guy. This guy was like maybe 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six. really tall dude. He was also very heavy built, like, like he was muscular, okay? I think it was because he actually was like in his mid-20s and he actually was like a guy who worked like out in a lumber yard or, you know, doing manual labor. So it's kind of funny how all these different people from different places and walks of life came together to play games in video arcades. It's pretty such a unique cultural phenomenon that this happened. So this guy loved to play Zangief. Because, of course, he's a big muscular dude. He likes to play the big muscular dude in Street Fighter. And... He was funny because he, he would, like I was a little kid at the time, I was like what, like 11, 12 years old when I used to be playing Street Fighter 2 and uh, you know I'd be playing and I'd be whooping people's butts because I was actually really good at it. I was one of the best players at my local arcade even though I was just a little kid and people would think I'm like a prodigy or whatever. And uh, he used to actually get, he would play, he was a really nice guy by the way, don't get the wrong impression, I say he's a big muscular dude, he was probably one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Like you could tell he's one of the stand up guys. He was very honorable. If, if, if someone had a quarter up and someone tried to skip their turn and he was there, he'd walk up and be like, you're not cutting in line, boy. I'm going to fucking pile drive your ass if you fucking think that you're going to cheat and skip someone, all right? So he, he was a very honorable dude. But he was also very funny. And uh, I remember I, I would beat him. Like, I would beat him in a game of Street Fighter. He'd be like, you little ass. And he would grab me, like, out of nowhere. I would guess my will, too. I'd be like, what's he doing? He would literally grab me and turn me upside down like he was going to tombstone pile drive me in the middle of the arcade. He'd go, you're going to beat me again, huh? You're going to beat me again? <laughs> and it was all in good fun. It was He was dicking around. It wasn't like he was being serious and he was actually going to hurt me or anything. But it was fucking hilarious. You know, he like, a little a kid beats him, so he'd pick him up like he's going to pile drive him in the middle of the arcade. It was fucking really good. But the story that I want to tell is... Actually, a story that's pretty well known among the arcade community, but a lot of people this era probably don't know anything about that this even happened, okay? So when Street Fighter 2 was released, the game was white hot. Everyone was playing it. Everyone wanted to go to arcades to play, okay? Electronic Gaming Monthly was one of the top gaming magazines at the time when Street Fighter 2 was released, and they did a giant expose covering the game, you know, full color, all the movesets and everything. They had a guy called Sushi X who they never showed his face, but he was supposed to be their fighting game expert. And the bottom line was, he wasn't actually really good at fighting games, but they always said that he was. But anyway, it was cool, because it was like every every magazine was covering it. It was really big news, Street Fighter 2. And uh, so EGM actually did a April Fool's joke. And people didn't know that it was an April Fool's joke, because it was the very first time EGM ever did an April Fool's joke. And it fucking mind-fucked thousands of people around the country so let me explain to you what it was they had a page just one page in the magazine 
where they said, our pro Sushi X has discovered a secret about Street Fighter 2 that no one knows. There's an extra secret character in the game. His name is Shang Long. So you remember that in the classic Street Fighter games, when Ryu won a match, he would say, you must defeat Shang Long to stand a chance. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that that was an, actually a mistranslation. What Ryu is supposed to say in his windscreen is you must defeat the Shoryuken to stand a chance. So he's basically saying you need to beat my Dragon Punch. But they mistranslated it to Shang Long. And so what EGM did is they took that mistranslation and co created a completely farcical, basically no non-existent character called Shang Long. And they said, oh, that's what Ryu's talking about in his windscreen. And in order to beat him, you need to beat the game on, like, the hardest difficulty. You need to beat it within, like, 30 seconds each game. You need to win every round, and you need to win every round with a perfect. Okay? Like, it was the most ridiculous requirements. And they're like, and then if you do that, at the final screen, instead of fighting M. Bison, Shang Long will come out and beat up M. Bison, and then you'll fight him at the end of the game as the final boss. And they even did doctored screenshots what they actually did is they took Ryu and Ken sprites and they put on gray hair and a gray ponytail and they made him basically kind of look like what Akuma looks like now only he was called Shang Long and so it was a great April Fool joke it was very well done at that time not a lot of people were good or good or even aware of Photoshop so no one knew this was fake they thought those were legitimate game screens they looked legit and people were flipping out like holy shit Shang Long and we gotta get play with Shang Long And so there were actually people who would rush to the arcades and try this. Oh, we got to beat the game without losing a round. And, of course, no one could do it. It's fucking impossible. How do you beat Street Fighter 2 without losing a round, without ever getting hit, getting all perfect? Like, you can't do it. I know someone who did it. His name is Joe. <laughs> and I felt so bad because it eventually was revealed that it was an April Fool's joke. But at the time, we didn't know. I remember Joe told me at one day... <laughs> He spent something like 50 bucks playing Street Fighter 2. Keep in mind, the game's only a quarter. Back then it was only a quarter. So he played the game hundreds of times, trying to get all perfect, all, you know, all, you know, within the time, all the, the stupid requirements, okay, that EGM listed to fight Shang Long. Whenever he got hit, he would unplug the machine, plug it back in, wait for it to reboot, and put another quarter in, and start over. And he, of course, he played with Zangief, which made it even harder. He couldn't even zone the computer with fireballs or anything. He had to legitimately beat the game. He did it. Guess what? Shang Long didn't fucking come out because it was an April Fool's joke. So he was so emotionally crushed, he was so angry, that he stormed out of the arcade and, like, didn't come back for, like, two weeks because he was afraid if he came back that he was going to just destroy everything. Oh, it was so fucked up. Imagine spending that much time on the game getting the requirements that they said you could do and then he doesn't come out. You're like, what the fuck? And then, of course, later on when it was revealed that it was an April Fool's joke, he didn't feel too good about that, but that was Joe. He was a character. I mean, he, he actually is a good guy. Later on, he ended up dating my cousin for a while. And I haven't seen him in quite a long time, but he was a good guy and he was one of those characters from the arcade. Now, speaking of characters, <laughs> there's different characters for different reasons. During the whole, I'd say, X-Men vs. Street Fighter era, when that game first came out in arcades, there was this guy from my local arcade, he was a shorter Hispanic guy, probably, again, early 20s, I'd say. His name was George, and he had the typical kind of Latino, thin, dark mustache, and the th thick black hair, and he was a loudmouth. He's kind of like, he, he's kind of like, almost, I want to say, he's almost like the Hispanic version of Joe Pesci. Let's put it that way. Like, he's very vulgar, always swearing, fuck this, fuck that. You know, especially in an arcade when there's kids. You're like, okay, if someone say, oh, fuck this, fuck that, fuck you, you suck. You know, he would be the one who's always swearing. And, uh, he would basically take it to the extreme, where if he was winning, he would go absolutely ape shit and be, like, talking so much trash. Oh, fuck you, you suck. Look at that, I kicked your ass, I whooped your ass. The one story I want to tell you, I swear to God this is true, and I know you probably won't believe me, I swear to God this is true. So, one day he beat me in X-Men vs. Street Fighter. His favorite character was Juggernaut, and he loved the character because when you did Juggernaut Super, which is the head crush where he comes forward, he has a flying multiple hit headbutt, it hits multiple times, and the more you mash on the buttons, the more it hits. I swear to God this happened. He, he did the head crush. 
he went nuts. He was on, let me, I'm trying to see if I can recreate this on camera here. So let's say where my hands are, are the game. He literally was like destroying the joystick with his left hand and going woof, woof, woof on the buttons. Like, I swear he must have destroyed the machine. He had to break it. He's going nuts. Oh, oh. And I swear to God, the Juggernaut head crush hit like a ridiculous amount of times. If I remember correctly, during that match, it actually did like, oh, geez, DSP, don't think of your back on the stream chat. I swear to God, the super hit me like 14 times. It's only supposed to hit like five or six times. And it killed my entire character. Like, he had, like, three-quarters health, and he died from one super. And I was like, like, staring, like, how the fuck did he just pull that off? And he goes, I swear to God, he does this. He stands, he's in front of the machine. So this is the machine right here, right? Oh, hold on, let me move back. This is the machine right here. He goes, I just fucked you. And he starts pelvic thrusting his dick into the machine. He's like, I fucked you, I fucked you, I fucked you. <laughs> He's like, yeah, baby, look at this, fuck, I'm fucking the machine. I love this game, I love it. Like, it was fucking the fucking arcade machine. It was the funniest fucking thing ever. Like, the guy was losing his mind because he beat me in one game, in X-Men vs. Street Fighter. But this is the kind of people I grew up with. He was in, he's a lunatic. He's just, like, having sex or sexual... I'm surprised he didn't take his actual cock out when he was doing this with a giant raging boner and start fucking the coin slot. The guy was that nuts. Oh, my God, he was just something else, man. It was funny as fuck. It was funny as fuck but disturbing as fuck at the same time. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, the next story. <laughs> this is I'm done. I can't watch anymore. <laughs> the next story is about my friend Drew. And uh, my friend Drew, uh, I grew up with him as well. We were, we're mutual friends. I still know him. He actually lives close by. And I see him from time to time. But we grew up being friends in the arcade. And, uh, you know, we used to play all the, the games together. He was the kind of guy, he wasn't just a one-game player, and I was the same way. Whenever a new fighting game came out, we played it and we gave it a shot. So I not only played Street Fighter, I played Mortal Kombat, uh, Mortal Kombat, <laughs> Mortal Kombat, Tekken, uh, Virtual Fighter, The King of Fighters, Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, Primal Rage, Time Splitters, War Gods. I mean, I know I'm naming every fighting game. Killer Instinct was a huge one, but I literally played them all. And he was the same kind of person. Where when a new game came out, he wanted to play the new one and try it out and even get to a competitive level with it. So it was cool because a lot of other people were like, well, I only play Mortal Kombat. I only play Street Fighter. And they wouldn't stop playing their respective games. But it was cool that there were also people who would want to jump from game to game and learn them all to get more variety of gameplay. And... Uh, there's this one particular story, and if he watches this podcast, he's going to go nuts because I'm telling this story, all right? We're both kids, all right? So we're, you know, probably young teenagers, I would say. And keep in mind, when you're a young teenager, especially if you don't have a job, maybe you've got an allowance with your parents, and that's how it used to be with me. My parents would give me like a 5 or $10 allowance a week. I would go to the arcade twice a week, spend $5, and, you know, spend three, four hours at the arcade. And you had to be very careful with your money because if you only have $5 and you have several hours to be at the arcade, you need to space out your games and space out your money so you don't blow it all in an hour and now you got nothing to do, okay? So for me, when I was at the arcade, to actually buy like a snack or a soda was a rare thing because I had a very limited amount of money that I would use while I was there. And so I remember this one particular day. I only had $5, okay? I was playing... The, I even remember, the King of Fighters 96 with my friend Drew. Actually, I take it back. I think it was actually the King of Fighters 97. I'm not positive. And I went and I got a soda, which cost a buck at the time. So now I've significantly reduced the amount of games I'm going to be able to play because I got a soda. I took the soda and I put it down right next to the arcade machine, right next to me. Like visibly, boop, there it is, okay? I had to get changed to play the game. And I said to Drew, I said, Drew, are you listening? He says, yes, Phil, I'm listening. I said, Drew... I'm about to go walk 10 feet to the change machine. I'm going to put a dollar in the machine, get change, come right back and play you in this game. But I've placed my open soda on the floor. Please be aware that the soda is... You know where this is going. So please be aware where the soda is, that it is there on the floor. Because it's, you know, my hard-earned money. This is not a lot I have to spend. And I would like to enjoy this delicious beverage while I play the game. I'm going to be right back. It's there. Please be careful of it. He says, yes, Phil. Thank you for telling me. I see it clearly placed right there, right next to the arcade machine, on the floor, out of my way, 
right there. I'll be careful. I'm just going to play the game while you're gone. Go get your money. Come back. We'll play the game. We'll have a good time. Very good. I said, okay, thank you very much, Drew. So I got up, just like this. I got up, walked over to the change machine, put my dollar in the change machine. Ching, 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 ching. All right, I got it. Get my, I got my, what was it, four or five? I think it was five tokens for a dollar at that time. Got my five tokens. Excellent. Very good. I walked back. All right. Drew, I'm back. I've got my money. I've And my soda was spilled all over the fucking floor. Just like, it looked like he had fucking punted it like a field goal. It was just all over the floor. A giant fucking huge pile of soda on the floor. I said, Drew, how did you kick the soda? Did I not warn you before I left that this soda? And Drew, of course, he's still goes, oh, I'll clean it up, I'll clean it up. And he runs over, he tries to pick up the can, but there's like none left in it, but he's pretending like there is. Oh, I'll save it, I'll save it. And he picks it up, and he runs over, he grabs paper towels from the front desk, and he's mopping it all up. I said, Drew, all I wanted to do was get some change to play the King of Fighters 96 with you, and you kicked my soda all over the fucking floor. And he it's like, no, I'm gonna, I'll make it up to you, I'll make it up to you. Oh my god, and it's hilarious, because every time I saw him after that, that would be the running joke. I, every time I had a drink in my hand, any time like that, I was like, now Drew, be careful. I have a drink. I'm gonna put it down. And you remember that time when you spilled my drink all over the fucking floor. <laughs> and I just made so much fun of him over the years for doing this. Oh, it was so good. Um, and, but Drew's a good guy, and don't worry, I'm not going to be a dick and only tell a funny story about him, now I'm going to funny tell a funny story about me that both Drew and some of my other friends always make fun of me for, okay? So, so, the flip side, I'll make fun of myself now. This one time there was a local tournament being held at our local mall, okay? When, I believe it was for either Marvel vs. Capcom 1 or Marvel vs. Capcom 2. It was probably Marvel vs. Capcom 1. And uh, at the time, I was trying to be like... like I, I was one of the best players, one of the best local players by far, okay? And uh, I was trying to be a smartass, and I said to the guy who was running the tournament, I said, hey, psst, come here. I got an idea. Let's freak these people out, all right? Let's freak them out because they know I'm one of the best players here. Tell them I'm not here. I'll give you the money here. Tell them I'm not here. And put me into the bracket as a buy. You know, it's spelled B-Y-E, buy. And what that means is that there's no one there to play, so someone basically gets a free win and moves on to the next round. I said, put me in as B-Y-E. That'll be my name. And so someone's going to think they're going to get a free pass. And, uh, you know, it'll be real funny because I'm one of the best players here. Act like I'm not here, and then when it's my turn, I'll walk around the corner and be like, ha-ha, surprise, I got this guy. All right, so it sounds like a funny idea, right? The guy who's one of the best players, you think he's not there, he shows up, he's a dick, he's going to fool everyone, haha, I'm really here. And people will be like, oh, damn it, I thought I had you know, a better chance, and now he's here. I'm thinking this is really good. Now, you may, be, <laughs> you may know what's going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> this is good. I didn't think it through. I should have thought a little harder about what I was going to do. But I was young and stupid at the time. I didn't think things through. I was impulsive, and I did dumb shit. So, I was actually hiding. The way that the arcade worked was that there was, it was a FYE, Afford Your Entertainment. It's a store chain here in America, or in the United States. And there was actually a giant store portion where you could buy video games, you could buy CDs, you could buy books, you could buy all kinds of stuff on that side. And then there was the arcade portion, and there was a doorway between them. So what I did, I hid in the store portion until I knew it was going to be time for this guy's match. So this guy actually called me. He's like, all right, you're going to be up. Are you coming? I was like, yeah, all right, I'm on the way. And so he says, all right, here we go. He's like, up next, it's going to be, uh, all right, let's say his name was Speedy. It's going to be Speedy against, oh, bye. So it looks like you've got to buy. And Speedy's like, all right, I've got to buy. And I ran through the doorway. I said, no way. I'm by. I'm by. Look, everyone, I'm by. <laughs> Oh, my God. And everyone's like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> oh, my God. It was the biggest blunder I think I've ever done in that regard. 
and they never let me let it leave it down, man. They still to this day when I run into them, someone they say, "Hey Phil, you remember when you were Bob?" <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Oh my god. So just kind of the funny stuff that happened to us, you know, in the arcade days. Um, I got another one. Another one. I'm not done. We've got a couple more. Two more to talk about before we end this segment. Um, so, there was a time when, before I was actually a major tournament attendee, what I actually would do, I attended all my local tournaments. I attended all the ones in, like, local towns at my local mall, my local arcade, but I never traveled to play Street Fighter, Okay. And then finally one year, after years of, you know, playing at the local arcade and actually my, my friends from the arcade traveling out of state to go to major tournaments in the area that weren't in Connecticut, finally one time they convinced me. They said, you got to come to ECC with us. Now, if you don't know what that is, that stands for the East Coast Championships, which for the greater part of a decade was the major uh, street fighter slash fighting games in general tournament on the East Coast. It was the biggest one by far. Unfortunately, a few years ago, it ended. But right, it was the biggest thing for over a decade. It was the biggest thing, okay? And this was the very first time that I was going. It was exciting. You know, I was like, wow, I've got a pack. I'm putting all this stuff together. I need my joystick. I'll take my game console. I'll take it with me. We'll hook it up to the TV in the room. We'll play in the room, too. But we're not at the arcade. We'll get the practice in the room. It was a whole bunch of us carpooling. We had a van that we were all going in. And I remember it was my friend Scott, my friend Dave Lou, his brother Hero Lou. Uh, Drew was there, myself. I believe uh, uh, our friend Dion was with us. A whole bunch of us all carpooling. We're all going to ECC together. And we're all going to have a fun time. We're looking forward to playing Marvel vs. Capcom and other games against the high-level tournament players. Like, yes. So keep in mind, it was a very hectic thing. I was packing all this stuff in and everything. Packing it up. <clears throat> boom, boom, boom. And so finally, I'm on the way out the door. My friends are all like, Phil, hurry up, hurry up. I was like, oh, shit. I'm sorry. I forgot to pack You know, ahead of time. And I was rushing to pack, 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 pack. Finally got all my stuff. And I'm on the front... Now, keep in mind, I live with my parents at the time. I was only like 18 years old, I think. I'm on my front porch of my house. I'm about to walk down the stairs and head to the van. All my friends are standing in front of my house, and I'm finally exiting the house with my luggage. My friends are relieved because we want to get on the road and get to the tournament. And I said, hurry up, Phil. Oh, thank God, Phil's finally coming out of his house. I took... I was on the front porch. I was about to walk down the stairs. My mom opens the front door and says, Philip! Because she calls me Philip. She doesn't call me Phil. She calls me Philip. She says... Philip, did you pack underwear? Now, just that happening for some people, you're probably laughing out loud that someone's mother would say to them, did you pack underwear in front of all their friends? Okay? But that's not the funny part of the story. The funny part of the story is that I stopped and I thought for a second and I had to turn around and go back inside because I didn't pack any underwear. <laughs> I would have been going balls free. I would have been flapping in the wind. I would have been going military style. Who <laughs> would have had no underwear for this tournament if my mom didn't fucking tell me, my dumb young ass, that I had to go back inside and grab some boxes. I was that stupid. <laughs> How funny was that? How stupid was I, okay? Oh, my God. Ugh. All right. So, the last story that I have to tell for this episode of Tales of Arcadia. Don't worry, I've got hundreds more. So, this is, there's plenty where this came from, okay? Comedy gold. The final story, way, way later. This actually took place at one of the final ECCs. This was actually one that I ran. It was myself and Josh Wigfall. Josh Wigfall is a very well-known, very well-respected player from New York City. And I was a well-known player from Connecticut. I'm not going to say well-respected because no one really ever respected me in the Street Fighter community. And we stepped up and we put our money and our effort together to run ECC one year when actually the longtime organizer uh, was not able to do it. And so we stepped up and we were going to run ECC and we were. We were running ECC. Unfortunately, this year, there was this one guy in the Street Fighter community who was a West Coaster. He's from, from California. But a big fucking mouth. And all he wanted to do was insult everyone and talk shit about everyone. And not a lot of people liked the guy. His name was Duck Jr., okay? And Duck Jr. was an interesting personality because, in all honesty, he was really good at Marvel vs. Capcom too. He was one of the best at the time. So he actually could back up the shit that he talked, but he would just be 
nasty. He would be so nasty about it with people and really just get personal with people and insult them and be just vile. And so a lot of people really disliked the guy because he wasn't a respectable person in that regard. So this year, he decided, of all things, he decided to attend ECC. Now, a lot of people were like, is this a good idea? Because no one really likes this guy. He always talks shit about the East Coast. He always talks shit. And he's literally going to be coming and have very few people from the West Coast here at ECC. So he's going to kind of be on his own. He's probably going to have a lot of shit talk to him because of the way he acts. Is he going to be able to handle it? What's going to happen? So, incidentally, this year was a year, I believe, uh, Josh Wigfall ran Marvel vs. Capcom 2. That was one of the games he wanted to run because he was really big in that community. And so I said, listen, I'll run Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, I'll run Capcom vs. SNK 2, I'll run Tekken, I'll, we did Dead or Alive that year, that was the year when the Xbox 360 launched, I said, I'll run Dead or Alive, you do Marvel 2, because that's by far going to be the biggest game, it's going to be the hardest game to run, you do all that, I can do the other stuff. So he was running that tournament, and I, the, one of the people, I guess he made him like the proctor or whatever, was either, I forget, and I, I apologize because I can't remember, it was either this guy named Mike Infinite from New York, or it was this guy called Smooth Viper from New York. I can't remember which one of them it was that actually was the one who did this, but they were the proctor for the tournament, so they had a megaphone. They were call oh, so-and-so, so-and-so, you're up, because this actually took place in New Jersey at 8 on the Break, which is an arcade, video arcade, in Donalyn, New Jersey, and so it was very loud in there with all the machines and everyone talking, so you need a, a megaphone to hear your name get called for your turn. <clears throat> so he goes, you know, he's calling the names or whatever. And then, of course, Duck Jr., when Duck Jr.'s up, he would go to play, and that was it. Everyone would be talking shit. Oh, you suck. You're going to choke here, Duck. So in, let me just say this, in Duck Jr.'s defense, and actually to say something good about the guy, the guy is brave and he has balls. Because he came to the East Coast completely surrounded by the opposition, not a friend in sight, and he came and he actually did okay in the tournament, okay? However, what ended up happening, which I had no ruling on because I wasn't running that tournament, unfortunately happened, and here's what happened. So, you had the guy who had the megaphone, and he, eventually some other people started grabbing it and saying funny stuff on it, which I'm okay with or whatever. <laughs> so, Duck Jr. goes to play, and he's playing someone from the East Coast, and he, he chokes. He drops a combo. He does. I don't remember what he did, right? And the guy who had the megaphone, of course, they hate him because the, he's, he's a big shit talker. He grabs the megaphone. I didn't see this because I was running my own tournaments. Apparently, he grabbed the megaphone, literally put the megaphone right in Doug Jr.'s face, and he goes, You fucking suck, you scrub. Now, imagine that. Someone putting a megaphone directly in your face and going, You fucking suck. It would be so loud on your face, right? So he flips out. And he's like, oh, fuck this, fuck you, I'm going to fucking fight everyone. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're, first of all, if you're going to start a fight, you got to go outside. It's not going to be inside this arcade. You go out to the street, you guys want to fight, you get arrested. That's none of our business. You get the fuck out of the arcade. So immediately we threw the people out who were involved. They were thrown out into the street, okay? Now, I don't know what happened after that. Apparently there was no fight, okay? So I don't know, maybe five, ten minutes pass. Everything calms down inside. And I'm running the tournament. I'm running the tournament, the other stuff. I don't know what happened. I don't want to know what happened. Whatever. Immature people acting immature. I'm running the tournament. Duck Jr. walks back inside. His hand is completely ripped apart on the knuckles. Gushing blood on the floor of the arcade. And he goes, oh, 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 oh. Like, like he can't even speak. He's, he doesn't even know what to say. I said, what the fuck happened? What the, it doesn't look like you fought anyone. What the fuck? I punched a tree. I just, I can't get over it. He punched a tree. Who do you think's going to win in the interaction between your fist and a tree? <laughs> so his hand is gushing blood. Finally, I had to go because they actually, luckily they had a, uh, a food, like a snack area in the arcade. And I grabbed a whole roll of paper towels, ran over to him, put it on his hand. I said, get the fuck outside till your hand stops bleeding because I'm not cleaning your fucking blood off the floor. So we went outside and he's pissed. He's like... Man, you see what happened? Do you see what happened? I said, no, I didn't see what happened. Oh, man, this is bullshit. This is your tournament. You could take care of this. I said, what would you like me to do? I could throw him out of the tournament. Is that going to help you? No. So, what, like, what do you expect? You came to a hostile environment, you know, where you knew everyone was going to be against you, and you have a big mouth. 
So you set yourself up for something like this to happen, and then you punch the tree. Like, I don't know how I can possibly help you. So he was all pissed off, and I don't know, I don't think it ever got resolved. I think basically he, he ended up, you know, he didn't do well in the tournament. His hand was destroyed, and, uh, and that was the end of it. So he really wasn't involved much more in the tournament for the rest of the tournament. But just some of the zany fucking stuff that happened in arcades in my lifetime, that's just a small snippet. That's just the icing on the cake. I have many more great stories to tell uh, in the future, but that's going to be it for this segment of Back in the Day with DSP and Tales from Arcadia, okay? All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening. Now we're going to go on another short break. I'm going to be back in just a few minutes. We're finally going to open up the stream to Q&A. We've got the raffle going, so this is your last chance based on the things that have happened in the podcast for you to submit your questions. So definitely do so. Submit them to the raffle right now. If you have not, please do not submit duplicates. That's not fair. That's cheating. And I'll be back in a few minutes. We're going to do that. If you're watching on YouTube... Go ahead and go look at the description of the video. You can click on the shortcut to go straight ahead to the next part. You don't have to watch the commercial break. I'll be right back. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you in a couple minutes.
Okay, everybody, we're back, and welcome to the third and final segment of this edition of Hate Live, uh, where we're going to be taking some questions right here from the stream. They've been uh, Everyone's been actively submitting their questions for the past hour and a half in the stream. It's now time to select from those questions and answer some of them. Probably going to do this for about 15 minutes, roughly. So let's get started. I would appreciate it if the mods could close the raffle and actually turn this, the, the chat to subscriber-only mode so that we may now be able to see the questions without the chat getting flooded. So, please everyone, if you could please do that. <clears throat> we had 209 submissions of questions. Let's see how this goes. All right, here we go. It says, user all balls no fury asked, if you had the chance, would you ever play ET for their Atari 2600? Well, all balls you know fury, I did play ET for the Nintendo 2600, the Nintendo. Atari 2600. In fact, I owned E.T. for the Atari 2600. I know how fucking bad that steaming pile of fucking Marmoset Dookie is. That game is terrible. It was a horrible fucking slapped together piece of garbage. It looked bad. It played bad. It sounded awful. The actual sound effects of the game pierce the eardrums to the point where you want to fucking rip your ear off your fucking head and shove it up your ass because it sounds better to hear your colon gurgling in your ear than hearing whoop, 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 and the horrendous fucking sound effects that they put in that thing. It had nothing to fucking do with the movie whatsoever. It was a shameless cash-in and there's a reason why still to this day a lot of people say it's the worst game ever made. It was terrible. Will I ever play it again? They actually had it, if you saw my uh, SGC footage, they had it running at SGC. I did not play it then. Maybe one day if I do a worst games of all time series and I judge for myself what really is the worst game of all time, then maybe I'll play it. So maybe it's, that is a cool idea that I could do in the future. All right, the next question is from user Creepscore. He says, why did you ruin the Demon Stoles playthrough by becoming massively overleveled, making boring, making boring... So it's not even proper grammar. Making boring so you get less views. Okay. Um, I did it because I fucking could. Because it's a video game, and you can choose to play a video game however you want. So maybe it's not always about views. Maybe to me the game is entertaining when I use a game mechanic that not it is not against the way you're supposed to play the game, but I use the game mechanic to make myself strong enough so that I can actually beat the fucking game instead of repetitively dying for hundreds of times, wasting my time, and taking me years to beat it. For me, I'd like to enjoy the game and actually beat it in a reasonable amount of time, not take four years to do it. And I also don't want these assholes constantly invading me, which would happen a lot, trying to break my gear and everything. I play the game how I want. There's nothing wrong with grinding in an RPG. There never has been anything wrong with grinding in an RPG. If you don't like the way I play the game, play it your fucking self. How about that? <laughs> All right, next question. Let's see. What? Mamamla? I can't. Whatever. I can't read the name of the guy. But his question is. Are you aware of a PC game called Shadowrun Returns? And if you are, will you play it when it comes out? Uh, yeah, I heard that it's a game that's supposed to actually be like a sequel to the original Shadowrun. Unfortunately, I was never a big PC gamer, and really I never played the original Shadowrun. So for me, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I don't even know when it comes out. I, I didn't see a solid release date for it when I went through my gaming schedule update. If it becomes hype that people want to see me play it, maybe I will, but I don't know too much about it because I never played the original Shadow Run. All right, next question. From user Omstar12. He says, What aspect of the game do you usually value the most? I usually value intelligent narrative over deep gameplay. Um, it depends because people play games for different reasons. Now, some people get hooked on the gameplay. There are games that are extremely repetitive. A, a perfect example of this would be Diablo. Yes, Diablo has good graphics, good story, but it's really the repetitive nature of the looting and the gameplay that people get hooked on, and that's why they play the game. For some people, it's the social aspect. You've got games like World of Warcraft, where people play a lot of the times just to hang out with people in a social environment. They're not even necessarily playing the game for the gameplay. On the complete flip side, you've got games that are made for the narrative, and that's why people like to play them. So you got games like The Last of Us, like Heavy Rain, where the story and characters are so unique and gripping that you want to keep playing to see what's going to happen. Regardless of if you're even enjoying the gameplay, you want to keep playing the game. So games have different unique uh, factors in them 
that would be a reason why someone would want to play the game. Now, this guy is asking, what is the aspect that I value the most? For me, I definitely would have to say, I appreciate a good story. And it doesn't have to be a story that's so insanely, you know, long with 100 characters. It could be a quick little snippet of a story or even one that's not even a clear story. I remember the game Limbo, how unique that game was. But as long as what's going on in the game is interesting to me, I want to keep playing it regardless of the kind of game it is. Look at games like Catherine, a game where it's a puzzle game. I really wasn't even getting the gameplay, but I wanted to keep playing to beat the game to see what was going to happen with the characters and the ending and everything. It was really cool. And compare that, again, with a game like Heavy Rain. The gameplay is very light, but the game is awesome because of the way that the, the, the writing was and the characters and their interactivity and the way that what you did in the game actually changed the plot of the game. So that's a major factor for me. And just take a look earlier in this podcast of the games that I said that were some of my favorite games from the SNES era, right? Earthbound, Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, Final Fantasy IV, Chrono Trigger, and Super Mario World. Out of those games... If you just take away Super Mario World, four outstanding stories with unique characters and elements that are just blow you away. And yeah, the bottom line is the gameplay is actually good too in those games, but if just those stories were present and the gameplay sucked, I probably still would have loved those games. So right there, I'd say that's probably the major factor for me is the story, the characters, the writing of the game. How good is it? And then the actual gameplay, yes, it is important, but it's not necessarily the major thing. And it's funny that I say that because I talk about a game like Street Fighter, that's very light on story and very heavy on gameplay. So obviously, in my case, there are some exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, I look for a good story. Okay, next question. Um, is not a question. This is actually from Roleplay Gaming 001. He made a statement. He says, I am not wearing anything. I am naked right now. Good for you, sir. Just like when you came out of your mama's womb. All right, next question is from Oscar1995, and he says... What characters would you like to see in Injustice? That is a good question. There's so many cool characters in the DC Universe that I feel they could have put into Injustice in a cool way. How about someone like uh, Booster Gold or Blue Beetle? How about some of the other Green Lanterns, like Guy Gardner? Um, how about, of course, the, the shoe in here, Darkseid? Why he's not even in the game, I have no fucking clue. It's so weird. What about Brainiac? Um, there's just, I mean, there's so many characters. Grog. Right? Or Gr Grodd, whoever the, the, the giant dude, monkey dude is, he was always a main character. Why is he in the, only in a background? Why isn't he a playable character? There's so many cool characters in the DC Universe that they can put in there. Obviously, Martian Manhunter everyone wants because he's already in the background. They're already teasing that he's going to be in the game at some point. Um, I, could, I could go on for hours just naming people from the Justice League, you know, people who I think really deserve to be in there. Uh, and the fact that they put Scorpion in there as a DLC character is a fucking joke, and I think everyone's really angry about it. Um, with good reason. So that's just a small handful of characters that I think would be made good at Injustice. Um, alright. Next question here. Uh, this one is from Official 4 Chan, and he says, What would the schedule of the summer, oh, what will the schedule of your summer games be? Will it be on your downtime when there isn't a new game? Or will it be like Demon's Souls and have a set date? You know, so people are interested. What is going to be, how is it going to work? Well, <clears throat> the bottom line is this. There are no new games. That's what I mean. There, like, are no new games coming out besides there's two DLCs next week, there's Dynasty Warriors 8 in the middle of the month, and there's this Deadfall game that I may or may not even play at the end of this month. So there quite literally aren't many, if any, new games coming out this year. Or, not this year, this month, sorry. So these are actually these summer games that I'm talking about, the Summer of Retro, are going to be played like normal games. It's not going to be like only one day a week. It might be like, all right, I start Legend of Zelda Link to the Past on Sunday, and I play it for one of my streams. I play it for Monday for one of my streams, and then maybe Tuesday and Wednesday I'm busy with DLCs, but maybe I continue it on Thursday, and so on and so forth. That may be the, how I do it, just like a normal game. So basically treat these games kind of like they're normal games. Now, you may say, okay, that's right, but what order are you going to play them? And I have not determined that yet. Like I said, there's five that I definitely want to do over the course of the summer. I don't know what one. I'm, I'm kind of bouncing between them all because I love them all so much. I mean, the one that's obviously not going to start first is Super Mario World because that's going to be co-op with John Rambo. But what I'm talking about is between Final Fantasy IV, Earthbound, Chrono Trigger, and Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, I love them all equally. So it's going to be hard for me to determine which one to play first, and I'm really going to have to think about it. What I may end up doing is a poll. I'm not sure. We're going to see. We're going to see what happens, but I'll have more on that as we progress. 
I'm actually curious now to see people's initial reactions to what the big announcement is. So. All right, next question is from Leo 87 and he says, will you play Final Fantasy VII? All right, I can answer this one definitively. No, I will not play Final Fantasy VII this summer. I may do Final Fantasy VII at some point in the future, okay? I'm going to be honest with everyone. At one point, I had plans to do Final Fantasy VII. I actually did record a little bit of it, and it looked like disgusting donkey shit with my camera. This was before I ever did direct capture. I think now that I'm doing direct capture, the game, I could actually put together a good playthrough of it, but I'm not doing it this summer. It may happen in the future. It's not going to happen yet. Okay? I don't want to have any misconceptions here. The next question is from Celosia Kitty. Holy shit. Celosia Kitty. And the, que the question is, cats or dogs? Um... My answer is neither. Uh, the bottom line is cats and dogs are cool. My parents have to have multiple cats. My girlfriend and people that I know have had dogs over the years. I, I actually am an animal lover. So I do like the animals. However, I'm the kind of person that I'm of the mentality that if I'm going to put in enough time, effort, and money to have a pet like that, really it's like having a kid when you think about it. you got to be responsible for their safety. you got to be responsible for... for uh, their food, for keeping them clean. It's literally like having a baby. If I'm going to have a baby, I might as well have a baby. And I'll be honest, I don't want to have a baby right now. Right now I'm busy with my life, I'm busy with my work. My goal right now is to work hard, and hopefully next year I'll be able to move into a place with my girlfriend and start planning out you know, the rest of my life and not have to worry about having a baby running around. I don't need a cat or a dog running around that I have to baby. So I don't want a cat or a dog, even though I love them to death, it's never been anything that I've sought in my life, and right now I really just don't want one. Okay. Uh-oh. I think I... Let's see here. All right, here we go. Next question. Um, from Jelsey, actually, from one of my mods. He asks, Will you consider adding some retro games from the PC era, like the Ultima series, Wing Commander, Might and Magic, Privateer, System Shock, Bioforge, etc.? Um, probably not. And the reason I say that is because those aren't the games I grew up with. When I grew up with, I did not have a gaming PC. I did not have a PC that was good enough to run video games. I was a console gamer. So I never, I, I quite literally, the games that you just mentioned, I never played at all. I know, I, I know what they are, but I don't know what they are. Like, I, I've never played them. So I doubt that that would be something that I would be interested in. Um... In addition, I think those are kind of uh, antiquated games. You know what I mean? A game like Super Mario World, anyone can jump in and play it at any time. But a game like Wing Commander, I don't know if people would even, like, would that translate well into a playthrough? You know what I mean? So, at that regard, the answer is probably no. There are some games that I am interested in. Like, remember Maniac Mansion, how cool that game was? That might be a game that at one point I, I consider playing. That's a classic PC game. But as for the games that you specifically called out there, no, because I never played them, and I, I, I'm not going to just start now. You know what I mean? Okay. The next question is from Gucci257, and he asks, Whatever happened to Min? Um, Min, uh, basically, he teamed up with Team Spooky, and he left Connecticut. He moved in with those guys in New York. He used to be in all the streams with Team Spooky. And I have absolutely no idea what happened after that because I don't follow fighting games anymore. That's the honest answer. When he lived in Connecticut, I knew where he was. I knew he was always hanging out with my friends. He was playing Street Fighter with us. Now I don't follow him anymore because I don't follow the competitive fighting game community. I don't even know if he plays it anymore. And that's really the answer to that question. <clears throat> okay. Next question. Okay. From Ovidius is his name. He asks... Aren't you bored out of your fucking mind playing so many video games? Do you not feel the need to do more serious stuff? Does providing trivial content completely satisfy you, or do you yearn for more? Well, first of all, Ovidius, you have to understand that what you just said is a completely subjective statement. It's not objective. You say that what I'm doing is trivial content. Shouldn't I be doing serious stuff, okay? Now, let's really think about what you just said. What is serious stuff, all right? Would you consider working on a major TV show or working on a major motion picture or cutting a record in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a studio for a major album? Would you consider that serious stuff? You probably would, wouldn't you? Well, all that stuff is considered part of the entertainment industry. 
guess what I'm a part of? I'm part of the entertainment industry, but it just so happens I'm part of the independent entertainment industry. This whole new industry that was created when the internet came out, and basically now everyone has the ability to publicly have a face, to publicly entertain you. So many comedians, so many people have come out of the internet rather than from one of these major mainstream sources of entertainment, and I am one of them. So if you think that entertainment is a trivial, non-serious thing, you're mistaken. It's actually billions and billions of dollars that come out of this entertainment industry, okay? Video games right now are actually bigger than movies and TV combined. Video games make more money than movies and TV. Yes, they do. So for you to say that for someone to be in the entertainment industry in regards to the biggest source of entertainment everywhere is doing something trivial and not serious, you're quite mistaken. And you might say, oh, well, I, that's because you just play video games all day. How can you take that seriously? I do take it seriously. It's entertainment. I get messages daily from people thanking me so much for brightening their day, for putting a smile on their face, for turning their frown upside down at a time when maybe in their life stuff was not going so good. And that makes me feel so great to know that not only am I making money and enjoying what I'm doing because I am a gamer and I get to play games for a living, but also I'm putting smile on other people's faces and making a difference in other people's lives. Now you tell me, at my old office job, where I worked 9 to 5 every day, and that's a lie because I really worked like 8 to 8 every day, you tell me at that office job where I was doing continuous improvement and getting helicopter parts in the door and out the door just so a few helicopters could fly, you tell me that that's serious work but I'm affecting so many more people in a positive way with what I'm doing now than what I was doing then. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. It's all subjective. That right now, there, I, I, there is this mentality of people that anyone who is successful on the internet is a joke. They should just go get a real job. And you have to understand that's completely the wrong mindset to have because I understand that, yes, there are people who have office jobs, 9-to-5 jobs, manual labor jobs, retail jobs, service industry jobs. Those are tough jobs, and I absolutely respect those people because until 2010, that's what I did with my life, and that's how I made my money and my living, and gaming was always my hobby on the side. But for you to kind of trivialize what I'm doing here and saying that it's not serious is very bigoted. It's very ignorant, and it's very closed-minded of a statement for you to say something like that, especially when you consider I'm doing better with this than I ever did at my old serious job, and I'm affecting more people in a positive way doing this than at my old serious job. So that's my answer to that question. Okay. One or two more questions, then we're going to wrap it up because I've been going almost two hours now. Next question is from the gay... The gayest ever? What? The gayest ever? Wow, what a name. And he says, Metal Slug Co-op with John. It's always a possibility. Metal Slug is a, a very long-running side-scrolling shooter series from uh, SNK uh, on the Neo Geo system. I absolutely love the series. They're all emulated now. That's something we could possibly do in the future. So there's the possibility of that. I actually really do like Metal Slug. All right. Next question from SDU777. And he says, Phil, do you ever enjoy having to play video games even before you lost your job and starting the gaming business? Did I ever enjoy having to play video games? I don't understand the question. Of course I always enjoyed playing video games. That's why I always did it as a hobby before I ever made a penny doing it. So if you're answer asking me, did I get into gaming for a job? The answer is no. I was a gamer that I just by complete chance happened to turn it into my job. All right. Next question from Tup. Tom Man 88 he says would you like John Cena more if he turned heel um just the idea of John Cena doing anything but than his standard bullshit that he does every single time yeah i would obviously like the John Cena character more if he turned heel every single person who's done wrestling has turned heel but they won't let John Cena do it because he's their cash cow and it's a joke at this point Cena has to change or else people will never respect him. And that's a shame because he is a hard worker. He's a great guy. He does charity work. But the fact is people detest the John Cena character. Not the man, the character. And so until John Cena does change in some significant way, which he hasn't for the past eight fucking years, people are not going to respect the character anymore. So would I respect him more if he turned heel? Not the man, but the character. Absolutely yes. Everyone in the business has to do it. But some reason he's protected. No, I think he does eventually have to do it to gain respect. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to do two more quick questions. So this one here, and I'll do one more, okay? This question is from Mischief, and he actually asks, isn't, that, isn't Mischief the lemon? I think he is. Well, anyway, he asks, do you miss the turn-based system that used to be so prevalent in JRPGs, or do you prefer the newer battle systems that have been implemented? Um, <clears throat> I think they're both good. I grew up with turn-based. What he means by that is everyone takes a turn. If you don't select your turn, the game freezes until you select what you want to happen for your turn. Today, they're more active. It's like, okay, there's stats, and all right, yeah, you, uh, you put shit on your sword that makes it do a certain amount of damage and have a certain thing, but it's all action-based. It's like you're actually like doing like a third-person combat action game. It's not turn-based combat anymore. Um, I like them both. I respect them both. I can see how people could like one over the other, but I actually have an open mind. I grew up with the turn-based. I like that. And that's why when I get a new one like that that comes out, I like it. But at the same time, I also like the action-based combat system. I think that's awesome, too. So I really don't have a definitive answer. I like them both. All right, and the final question that I'm going to answer from the coming Reaper, the question is, how do you feel on the matter of Japanese games taking Western influences? Why is it such a divided subject, and are Japanese games still relevant in your opinion? Um, <clears throat> well, the bottom line is this. Japanese games, for a very, very long time, refused to change. While the whole gaming landscape was changing, while gaming went from something that was very Japan-centric to actually spreading across the entire globe, and actually was affected by other cultures other than Japan, the Japanese game developers really just kept putting out the same shit over and over and over and over. And so you can only play this certain style of game a certain amount of times until you get burnt out, unless you're like a hardcore fan of that style of game. So what ended up happening was there were people who actually were like hardcore fans of certain style of games that absolutely loved them and kept buying them, but it became a niche market, and more games that were different than that started to appeal more to the mainstream. So are you surprised that you're now seeing Western influences on the Japanese game market when you look at sales numbers, and the biggest games that came out in the year are... Gee, all developed by Western companies like Call of Duty and your usual shit that they shovel up mad in and all that crap that comes out every year. You have to understand that whatever sells is going to become what's more mainstream and more popular. So I'm not surprised that Japan has to change. They waited so long to do so. The question now is, now that they are changing and you're seeing Western influence in some Japanese games, can they survive when these other games already have the market share? That's quite an interesting question. I don't know if I have the answer to it right now. I don't know if I have the answer to anything right now because we're about to see a new generation of consoles. We're about to move into the new era of games. It's going to be exciting. I don't know what's going to happen. At the same time, you've got mobile gaming that's catching up and actually becoming more market share than the standard consoles. And it's pretty nuts what's going on right now. Like I don't think anyone is sure of what's going to happen with consoles, with mobile gaming, with anything. Right now, it's kind of a, a brave new world. And so for the next few years, we're going to have to see what happens with gaming uh, in, all together. So really, I have no answers for you. Um, but it makes sense that there is Western influence in Japanese games, since Western games are selling better than Japanese games overall. <coughs> Excuse me, that was disgusting. All right, so that is it for this edition of Hate Live, the beta podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that it was informative and fun and entertaining. I really hope that you enjoyed Tales of Arcadia, which there will be more in the future. It's not going to be next Tate Live. We'll take a break out to talk about something else, but we will be coming back to it in the future. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed my announcement about the summer of retro. And again, if the graphic designers could get on it, start designing shit for those games that I mentioned, even summer of retro logos and stuff, I'd be very appreciative because I'm going to get on this right away. I may be starting the summer of retro as early as this Sunday. So it's a big thing, and I want to be able to be ready for it. So let's see if we can get it going. All right, everyone? So spread the word. As soon as I actually stop recording this podcast in just a moment, I'm actually going to upload this to YouTube. So anyone who missed the podcast will be able to hear all about the announcement and get all the info. Thank you so much for listening in to the podcast. I appreciate it. I'll see you next week for Ask the King. That's right. Next week will be Ask the King, July 4th, Independence Day here live on the first stream on my channel of that day on Twitch TV will be Ask the King and also subsequently I'll be uploading that to YouTube. So thanks a lot everyone for this edition of Hate Live. Dark Side Phil signing off. Have a good night and I will see you for new gameplay coming up in the next few days. The Ouya tomorrow 
And the summer of retro begins sh soon, so stay tuned for more details on what I'm going to be playing first. Thanks a lot. Peace out. Good night.